Part 8. Lost in the Forest. When had finished my work among the orchards in the southwest of British Columbia, I took the train to Kamloops, an important town some 200 miles northeast of Vancouver. The district agriculturist met me at the railway station with a truly alarming list of properties whose owners wanted water. Early next morning we set off on a long journey to a large cattle ranch, which was in desperate straits. When we turned off the highway onto the gravel road leading to the homestead, we saw a young man breaking in a horse. My companion who was an expert horseman, stopped the car to watch, which made me very apprehensive, for in many parts of British Columbia horses are broken in with fiendish cruelty, so I was afraid of what I might have to witness. I once saw an exhibition of this in Victoria, the capital. During the winter, when the snow made it impossible for me to work, I and a number of friends used to spend hours in a riding school, where we practiced the haute école and learned how to make our horses change feet when cantering and teach them to pivot on one foot. The school was owned by a riding master who was a good instructor and a pleasant man. His wife unfortunately would have been more suitable as a warder at Belson. One day I went to the school unexpectedly to arrange for a special jumping lesson and found her in the smaller school building breaking in a horse. She tried to stop my coming in but she was too late and I saw what she was doing. It was such a fiendish exhibition of cruelty that no normal person could even have imagined it. Young wild horses, called mustangs or broncos are trapped in corrals on the western plains of the North American continent and are then brought to the cities in droves for sale. They are quite wild and have probably never seen a human being until they are rounded up. The people who buy them have only one idea of how a horse should be broken in. Like the wife of the riding master, they tie the frightened creature to a post, and sometimes one back leg is tied to another post, and simply flog them until the poor things are nearly dead. The pony, which the riding master's wife was handling, was half Arab. It was dripping with blood and sweat and great welts stood out all over its body. It was shaking and suffering so terribly that it would have fallen, if it hadn't been tied so tightly to the post. Worst of all were its eyes. If I am ill or have nightmares, those eyes still haunt me. They were bloodshot and half-glazed, not only with terror and pain, but with the most pathetic bewilderment. I had only once before seen this in the eyes of an animal and that was in India. My host, a cousin, gave a tiger shoot in my honor. It was on the borders of Nepal, near the foot of the Himalayas. A deer came tearing out of the jungle, frightened by the noise of the beaters who were banging pans to drive the tigers and other big game towards the guns. The deer stood for a moment, wondering which way to turn, and the man I was with shot it. As its legs crumpled beneath it, I saw the same look of utter bewilderment come into its eyes before they glazed. It was heartbreaking and horrible and cured me of any wish to shoot big game. But the deer died a quick death with no vestige of torture, whereas that wretched pony in the riding school was suffering dreadful torture at the hands of that fiendish woman. Even while she was talking to me, she turned round and struck the pony again and again, if it moved. I said, but what has it done? What has it done? Done? She replied. Why nothing, of course, but it has to be broken in, hasn't it? You had better get out of here, or I will show you how I do it. With all that so vividly in my mind, I was afraid of what I might have to witness, when watching the horse being broken on the ranch near Kamloops. So I was relieved to see that the young man's methods were not cruel, although he was not so gentle as horse breakers are in England. Still, I was pleased when we moved on to the house where I met the tall and handsome owner of the ranch and began my work. Later on, the young man who had been breaking in the horse strolled over to where I was working and watched me as I had been watching him. He appeared to be very interested in my divining and, when I had finished the final work of testing the purity of the excellent supply of water which I had found and had walked over to some shady trees to rest, he came across and sat down beside me. Without any preamble, he said are you any good at finding gold? I know about your water finding for I was down at Mr. Stevens' orchard in the Okanagan district last Sunday and he showed me the wonder well, as it is called, that you found for him. But water isn't gold. Gold is what I am interested in. What about it? Up to that time I had had no opportunity of working for gold, and I asked him why he was so interested. 
he then began to tell me about a gold mine which he owned in partnership with an older man, about ten miles from the town of Quinell, pronounced Quinell, on the Fraser River some two hundred miles north of Kamloops, and which was then receiving a lot of publicity in the press through being the center of a gold rush. After a bit he went away, saying, Think about it, will you? See you later. He turned up unexpectedly several times while I was in the district and watched me at my work. Just before I left for another town called Vernon, he asked me definitely whether I would go to Canal in my first spare time and do some divining for gold at the mine. He gave me few details about the mine, beyond the fact that they had been tunneling into the side of a mountain on a big reef, which had formerly been carrying good gold. Now the reef had faulted and they could not find it again, although both he and his partner were experienced prospectors. He explained that the mine was in dense forest, which added to their difficulties, since they could see nothing on the surface. As divining depended on feeling and not on seeing, he thought that I might succeed where they had failed. Was I willing to try? As I had no idea that going to a gold rush would be regarded as a highly unconventional proceeding, I agreed. I thought that it would be a new experience, but the reality far exceeded my expectations. I was assured that there was a very comfortable camp at the mine and that I would be housed in the shack occupied by the wife of the overseer who was the only woman attached to the camp. It chanced that an epidemic of chickenpox prevented my visiting the town that was next on the government's list, so I took the opportunity of fulfilling my promise to the young man and set forth for Quinell. I found him waiting for me at the station, and we went straight to the hotel. The town was crowded with rough-looking miners and the hotel was packed. I then met the young man's partner. He was a much older man and very unprepossessing, with a scrubby black beard. He was curiously unfriendly and seemed almost antagonistic, which made me feel sorry that I had undertaken the adventure. However, during supper he seemed to recover and I began to think that I must have imagined his hostility. As the hotel was packed to overflowing, I was put into the best parlor to sleep on the sofa. The hotel manager took the precaution of locking the door, which was wise, since the whole population seemed to be roaring drunk. About three o'clock in the morning the hotel quietened down and at daybreak we were off on horseback for a long ride up the mountain, which was clothed in the dense forest customary in British Columbia. It was a tiring ride, as anyone who has climbed the foothills of a mountain range on horseback will know. I did all I could to ease my horse, in spite of my light weight, until the young man said sarcastically, Why don't you get off and carry the poor horse? Your weight would kill any animal. After which I settled down to a grueling ride, with the day growing hotter and hotter all the time. When we reached our destination I found that it was a well-established mine with some twenty men on the payroll. The camp was on a sort of plateau in a natural clearing in the forest and the mine was about half a mile away. We arrived just in time for a meal. The heat was so great that I did not feel much like eating, but I realized that I must eat then or go without food until next morning. The old man, he wasn't really old, but his dreadful beard made him look as if he were, came up to the shack to fetch me and I followed him down to a long wooden building, from which came men's voices and a rattle of knives and forks. When we entered there was a sudden silence and all gazed at me as if I was some extraordinary animal that had escaped from the zoo. Well, boys, he said, this is Miss Penrose. This seemed to break the tension somewhat and from around the table came a concerted grunt, to which I weakly replied, A, ah, how do you do? In a mouse-like squeak. I was then instructed to sit in an empty place between two tough-looking men, which I did but, not knowing what to do next, just sat. Finally, one of the men an enormous creature with a week's growth of beard on his face took pity on me. Say, aren't you going to eat something? You just help yourself. Then, as it was obvious that I was a complete greenhorn, he took my plate and turned over the contents of a huge dish of stew with his own fork. When he found what he considered was a succulent morsel he dumped it on my plate with enough potatoes and onions to feed a dozen people and told me to eat it up as I wouldn't get any more food until morning. From then on he constituted himself my special protector. Apparently the mouse squeak had won the day, for the junior partner told me afterwards that there was nearly a strike when the men heard that a diviner, and a woman at that, was coming up to the camp. 
They were not going to be told by any adjectival woman where to look for the blasted gold and they knew just what sort of woman would go to a mining camp and a lot more which was not repeated to me. But, from then on, I had the greatest courtesy and kindness from these rough men that I have met with anywhere in my travels. When I crawled into bed that night I was soon dead to the world, but was awakened by the piercing cold of the mountain air and the effects of the gigantic meal which I had been forced to eat to avoid giving offence to my new friends. The camp was early astir and, when I opened the door of the hut to go to breakfast, I found the ground covered with three inches of snow, which, after the scorching heat of the previous day, seemed hardly possible. At breakfast the discussion was whether I should start looking for the lost load despite the snow and, as everyone had something to say, I could feel that the antagonism of the previous evening had disappeared and that I was now accepted as one of themselves. The verdict was no. After the men had gone off to the mine the camp become curiously still. I sat on a log looking at the dazzling beauty of the scene and enjoying the warmth, when I noticed that the snow was covered with a yellow mist. It did not take me long to discover what the mist really was, swarms of mosquitoes which settled on my hands and face with unholy delight. My riding breeches and high-laced field boots protected the rest of me, but I had to flee to the shack to put on a hat and be veil, which I often wore to keep off the flies. I then took my divining rod and proceeded to explore the camp. For no apparent reason I soon began to feel alarmed. There was no sound but the twittering of the birds and I told myself not to be silly. But my uneasiness persisted and grew worse. I kept the camp in sight, for I have no bump of locality and am always afraid of getting lost. At last I became almost petrified with fear. I knew that many of the Red Indian tribes still hated the white man and, when anything was done to arouse their resentment, they put curses on him and the places where he lived. I felt more and more convinced every minute that I was surrounded by a terrific force of evil and that the mountain had been cursed by the redskins. I also knew that when one is alone and otherwise unprotected one's greatest protection lies in reciting the Lord's Prayer out loud. It should be done over and over again without a break as the ritualistic formulas, called mantras, of the East are recited, and its power over the forces of evil is very great. I then walked back to the hut and sat down to think how I could make the old man believe what I had to tell him. I had plenty of time to think it over, for I didn't see him until the evening when he came up to the hut to arrange for an early start next morning. He sauntered in and walked over to where I was sitting. Charlie tells me you didn't eat any supper. Why is that? I hope you ain't sick. We can't have sick people up here. Then, without giving me a chance to assure him that I wasn't sick, he added, when I first saw you at Quinell, I said to myself that Bill was stark mad to bring a person like you here. They are good boys up there at the mine, but it is no place to take a woman. It would take two of you to make a shadow and it sticks out a mile that you are English. I was fair mad with Bill and told him so. As for your doing any work, why I could have laughed if I hadn't been so angry. But Bill said to pipe down as he had watched you at work several times, and some of the places you had gone to were pretty rough, but you had got on fine with them all. He said he wasn't a bit afraid that you couldn't get along with the toughs on the mine, so I let you come. And now I suppose you are going to be sick. A pretty mess that would be. He stopped and sat down to light his pipe, so I hastily began speaking. I am not ill, not a bit ill, Mr. Rogers, but I am frightened, horribly frightened. This time I really had put my foot in it. He leapt to his feet and shouted. Frightened? Who frightened you? Now that I won't have. You tell me at once who frightened you and I'll get your friend Charlie to deal with him. You know, the big fellow who sits next to you at meals. He used to be a bruiser. He'll settle him. I saw the difficulty I was in and the problem of making him understand. No. No, I said. It wasn't somebody, but something, and before he could start haranguing me again, I asked him whether Red Indians had ever had a village where the mine or the camp were situated or if they had lived on the mountain. He looked at me as if he thought I must be quite mad. No. They have never lived up here. Their village was down at the foot of the mountain, but they used to come here to dig for gold. In fact, they found a reef which we were working on. But what has that got to do with your being frightened? 
Quite a lot, I replied. Have you never heard of red Indian black magic and curses? In a moment he was standing over me, shouting the place down. Do you mean to tell me that you, an educated lady, can sit there and ask me to believe such rubbish? Black magic and curses. There aren't such things, and you know it. Miss Penrose. Why, you are turning out worse than I feared. I knew what sort of person you were as soon as you walked into the hotel. I didn't leave England myself until I was twelve. So I can remember what the people there were like. My father was butler at the hall. It was a beautiful place in Devonshire, about ten miles from Torquay. I remember it as though it were yesterday. I could see that talking about England had aroused some deep-rooted memories, for he went on talking more quietly, half to me and half to himself. I can see his lordship and the young ladies now, as plainly as I can see you. And I remember the terrible day when the doctor said that my mother had got consumption of both lungs, what they call TB out here, and his telling my father that the only way of saving her life was to take her to the mountains, just as if mountains grew in the next village. I thought the news would kill my father, he was so devoted to my mother, and I thought that it would kill me too, for there was no one in the world like my mother. I remember going into the stable yard and sitting by the big yard dog, crying like a baby. It was there that my father found me. He sat down beside me and put his arm round my shoulder and said, Donald, my boy, when life deals you a hard knock it never gets you anywhere to sit down and cry about it. The only thing to do is to get busy and see what you can do to make things better. Then he began to tell me about his plans, which altered all our lives. Don, he said. As you know, I have always wanted to see Canada, and I have read every book I could about the life out there. I very nearly went there before you were bomb, but I wanted to marry your mother and that's why I didn't go. But I think it is where we ought to go now. There are mountains everywhere in Canada, I believe and, if your mother is willing, we will all go together. Nothing really matters but getting your mother well again. So we came to Canada and went to a place called Barkerville, about thirty miles from here, where there are big forests below the mountains. My father got a job as bookkeeper in a logging camp and my mother got better every day. The camp was miles from the nearest town, so I didn't have any more schooling and spent my time with the loggers, learning how to pick and mark the best trees for felling. In a year or two I got pretty good at felling them myself and there wasn't much I didn't know about trees and forests and the animals in them. What is more? In spite of my being only a boy, I never got lost, though I would be out alone for days with a pack on my back and a gun, often without a compass. Then something seemed to break the spell of his early memories and he again turned angrily on me, I tell you, if the boys at the mine were to hear you talking about black magic and curses they would come out on strike. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Miss Penrose, and he stood over me with his face scarlet, and his horrid beard bristling with rage. By this time I was also getting very angry, and it seemed hopeless to try and make him realize the danger threatening him and the mine. However, I faced up to him. I can assure you, Mr. Rogers, I said, that what I have told you is very real. The Red Indians can and do curse places and this is one of them. If you stay here, nothing but disaster will happen to you all. You talk of me being sick, but it is your men who will be sick and will suffer accidents, and you will get no gold. The gold belongs to the Red Indians and the mine will ruin you and your partner and bring evil to everyone on it. He listened without trying to interrupt me, which I hadn't expected, and seemed to lose a good deal of his aggressiveness. Then, to my surprise, he said, well, well, well. Maybe yesterday you were tired from that long ride in the hot sun and just imagined things. The height up here often makes people go a bit queer in the head at first. Then he added, with a sigh, I sure wish my old woman were here. She would give you one of her rhubarb pills and you would be as right as rain in no time. See you tomorrow. Breakfast at seven and, without waiting for any reply he departed down the hill to the mine camp. Next morning at breakfast it was decided that, before I went searching for the missing reef, I should be shown over the mine. So the senior partner and I walked across after breakfast and I saw the crushing plant and the main shaft, which had been driven into the mountainside. Then the old man and I set out to look for the reef but, first of all, 
he insisted upon our going back to the camp as he was not wearing the proper boots for forest work. What a forester fears more than anything is a sprained ankle or broken leg for, if he is alone, as he generally is, it may mean death before he is found. The long-laced boots, which all foresters wear and which I was wearing myself, have saved many serious accidents. They are also a great protection against the rattlesnakes which are so prevalent in that part of Canada. But, instead of following the beaten track back to the camp, the old man decided to take a short cut through the forest. He led the way and I followed in his footsteps, for it is customary in the forest to walk in Indian file. After about half an hour, I thought it was very odd that we had not reached the camp, because it had only taken about a quarter of an hour to walk from the camp to the mine along the usual trail. So I asked him whether we were not nearly there, to which I received a curt reply that we should be there in a few minutes and he was just taking a look round on the way. We walked for another half hour and then another and I realized, to my horror, that we were lost in the terrible forest. The tall firs shut out the sun and, as their lowest branches were some thirty feet from the ground, smaller trees grew under them and beneath the latter smaller still, so the going was very hard and the gloom intense. What frightened me more than anything else was the discovery that the old man, an experienced forester, was also terrified. Then I remembered his boots and thought of what would happen if he twisted his ankle. I no longer looked upon the trees as friends, as I did when I was a child. They were enemies. The branches smacked my face and twisted themselves around my legs and tried to throw me down. The old man and I sang songs, cracked feeble jokes and told each other stories, we both realized that, whatever happened, we must not panic. So long as we kept our wits about us, we still had a chance. We stopped to look at the trunk of a tree where a full-grown stag had rubbed the velvet off his horns in springtime. The old man told me what sort of deer it was from the dents and cuts in the bark and its age from the height of the marks, allowing so many inches for each year. Goza to this tree was another where, he said, a very young deer had rubbed off the first velvet from its horns, as the marks were much lower and far less deep, because the horns of a young deer are still tender and it would cause him discomfort if he cleaned them as vigorously as an older stag. On the same tree, but higher up, were the marks of a reindeer, who had used it for scraping his enormous branching horns. The reindeer is known in North America as the caribou, a red Indian word meaning the power or scratcher, because they pour the snow aside in winter to get at the moss beneath. These creatures generally lived much further north, so the winter must have been exceptionally severe for it to have come so far south. But it is to the chipmunk, that tiny, saucy, little grey squirrel, that the Red Indians look for their prognostication of the coming winter. If the chipmunk builds his nest and store low down in the tree trunk, the winter will be mild, with little snow, especially if his storeroom is only a small one. But if he builds his winter quarters high in the trees and the storeroom is big and well stocked, the snow will be deep and the winter long and severe. In parts of Canada, but well below the Arctic Circle, the temperature will drop to 55 degrees or 57 degrees below zero, minus 87 degrees to 89 degrees of frost, but with some strange instinct unknown to man these little creatures can foretell the winter weather and provide for themselves against what is to come. We saw a porcupine which showed no alarm at our approach and continued on his leisurely way. The old man said that they were preserved and no one would ever dream of killing one, except as a last resource. They were the only hope left to a man lost in the forest, when he had exhausted his food and ammunition, for they can be easily killed with a stick and roasted on a fire of leaves and bark. I felt that we would soon be eating porcupine, but it gave the old man quite another idea, for he plunged his hand into his pocket and a look of utter consternation came over his face. He turned towards me and asked whether I had a match. I hadn't, not being a smoker. When I realized what this meant, I nearly panicked. With matches, we could have lit a fire and the smoke filtering through the treetops might have been seen from the camp when the men became uneasy because of our non-return. As it was, the coming night might bring a blizzard like the night before and we were both dressed in thin clothes for the heat of the day. We had no food with us and, having eaten nothing since the early morning, the long walk was telling on us both. It was now three o'clock by my watch and we had been fighting fear for six hours. 
the old man might have been able to make a fire by rubbing two sticks together, as the Red Indians do but, owing to the snow on the previous night, we could find no sticks dry enough to burn. Many years before, I had read somewhere that when people lost in a forest get panic-stricken they tend to start running without knowing where they are going and I felt myself becoming obsessed with the idea that I might begin to run and that the old man, not having proper boots, would not dare to follow, or, worse still, that it might be he who started running and either I couldn't keep up with him or he would break a leg. In either case it would be the end of us both. Then there was the fallen timber which covered the floor of the forest in many places and which had to be climbed over, as it was too thick to get round. It was an even bigger danger than wild beasts, for a foot slipping between two tree trunks often means the leg being snapped like a matchstick, with a slow death from exhaustion and exposure the result. I was near exhaustion myself when I had another horrible shock. The old man stopped suddenly and said in a hoarse whisper, Listen. I hear someone calling. Yes. There's someone calling. He had a strange, wild look in his eyes and there wasn't a sound to be heard. One of the most remarkable things about any dense forest is the absence of all sound. But the old man kept stopping to listen every few minutes, and I thought that he was going mad. I tried to thrust the thought out of my mind but how could an experienced forester get lost close to his own camp, unless there was something seriously wrong with him? Finally, I got him to sit on the truck of a fallen tree and put my hand in his, which he gripped like a frightened child, while I repeated my mantra quietly to myself. Never have I felt so desperately in need of its help and protection. Gradually I felt the tension of his hand relax, and presently he said, in a rather more normal voice, come. We must go on. We are going to be all right, for we must surely get out soon. Instead of being reassured by his change of mood, I was more afraid than ever that he had gone mad, as the sudden change from abject fear to this strange calm was too quick to be natural. But he started walking again and I had to follow. Then, after what must have been a few minutes, though it seemed hours, we came round the side of the mountain and saw some old mine workings below us, with some partly overgrown trails which must lead somewhere. We were saved. I threw my arms round the old man's neck and wept on his shoulder, despite his dirty old beard. I have a shrewd idea that he wept too. The trail led us to a country road, a passing farm cart picked us up and took us to Quinell, where we had a meal. We then borrowed two horses and started the grueling ride up the mountain track back to the camp. By now it was getting dusk, and the men were out in groups of three looking for us. About a mile from the camp my friend Big Charlie and two other men met us. I was too exhausted to do anything but cling to the horse's mane, so Charlie just lifted me out of the saddle and carried me up the mountain to my shack, as if I were a baby. Then he laid me on the bed where I slept, boots and all, without moving until nearly midday next day, when someone brought up a meal for me. I tried to get up to eat it, but found that it was too much trouble and went off to sleep again. In the evening there was a knock at the door and the old man came in. He sat down heavily in the chair by the door. He looked so ill and old I could hardly recognize him. Fancy me being lost, was the first thing he said. It is past belief. Me, who has been in the forest since I was a boy and have never been lost before. He sat huddled in his chair, utterly dejected. I still don't know what happened, he added. I was like a man walking in a fog and I couldn't see properly either. All my knowledge of the forest was gone and I was a strange man in a strange land. Me, who knows the forest like my own hand and it has been my home, so to speak, for forty odd years. And then that voice, calling, calling. I heard that again last night. He paused and then went on again, as if the words were forced out of him. And I must admit it, I was afraid. Frightened in a forest? No. There's something mighty queer up here. I half believe you're right. The Indians may have done something funny to this place. Not that I am admitting anything about curses, mind you, but, well, just something funny. Look, he continued. You said there would be sickness and accidents. One happened this afternoon. One of the boys had his hand caught in the crusher and lost two fingers. He bled something dreadful. I don't like it. Not a bit. He was silent for a minute and then, 
By the way, Charlie wants me to say he hopes you are doing fine and, for the first time, the old man laughed. He's tough, is our old prize fighter, about the toughest man we ever had up here and his language is pretty awful. Yet he is like a little puppy dog on a string when you are about. Damn funny, I call it. Anyway Bill was right when he said that you could get on with the boys. You get on with them fine and they all think you're wonderful. Next day, the tunnel collapsed, injuring two men. Taking two injured men down the mountain on horseback was pretty grim. Later in the day, another man hurt his leg. No attempt was made to get me to look for the lost reef again. On the following day after breakfast I took my departure. As each man came out of the breakfast hut, I shook hands and said goodbye, leaving Charlie to the last. I thanked him for all he had done for me. Instead of being pleased, he looked at me in blank horror. Here, miss, he said, you can't go thanking me. Tisn't right somehow. I haven't done nothing for you. Honest. When I shook hands with him, he was shaking like an old man with palsy. It was probably the first time in his rough life that anyone had actually thanked him for anything. The junior partner escorted me to Quinell and I was soon back in my flat in Victoria, where I became very ill. My standby and all my adventures had been my ability to sleep but, this time, whenever I dropped off to sleep, I would awake screaming or in a bath of perspiration, pursued by fire or caught in a blazing forest. It was always fire, fire, fire. I didn't dare call in a doctor, as I was afraid that he would think that I was really mad. One day a friend, a young woman lawyer, came to see me. She was shocked at the state I was in and promised to send a friend of hers to talk to me. He was a learned man and a professor of anthropology, with a profound knowledge of the Red Indians and their curses and ceremonies. I was surprised to receive a youngish man, who quite understood all I was talking about. He took particulars regarding the situation of the mine and returned next day to tell me, what I knew before, that the mine had been worked by Indians who had been turned out by white men and put in a reserve. So they cursed any whites who set foot on the ground and sealed the mine, so that no one could get any gold from it. It was an effective curse. The partners never found another ounce of gold and the lost reef was never discovered. Many of the remaining men working on the mine met with injuries and the others drew their pay and went elsewhere. The two men were nearly ruined. The professor knew just what to do to break the curse, which he said, had fastened onto me since I was in touch with the forces of nature. But the cure took many weeks, many curious ceremonies and much earnest prayer to break it and set me free and it was a long time before I was well again. End of Part 8 